All right, everybody, welcome to episode 198 of the SEO Vault. Joining me today is Igor, one of our team members at Web20 Ranker. How are you doing, Igor? Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome. So today we've got a bunch of exciting new things to talk about. So Igor works within the managed search. Um, section of web 20 ranker he's also done a lot of contributions towards the new dashboard that we're building so we're going to be able to gain some insight from igor as well as take a look at the usual things that we share on the vault so the seo vault remember that we publish these every week you can find us on seovault.com as well as all of the other major podcast platforms so be sure to check us out if you have a better method of a uh, more preferred method of listening to podcasts and please go ahead and give us a like and share this with your other friends or coworkers that work in the SEO industry so they can gain some insight as well. As always, we love your feedback. So thank you so much to everybody that leaves us comments. Um, Last thing I'll mention is we are also posting these videos on our YouTube channel. I know that's how a lot of people like to watch these. So without further ado, this is Igor. So today, Mike will not be joining us. Well, he might be a little bit late maybe, but it's just going to be us two going through uh, the typical news, some brand updates, and we're going to talk about one of the blog posts that were just published that was just published to the Web20 Ranker website. Um, so that we'll be talking about anchor text analysis or just anchor text in general. Last week we introduced this topic um, and we talked in great detail about just like the overarching methods that I've seen people use that aren't the most efficient. So hopefully we'll be able to expand upon that and Igor would be probably one of the best people to give you the uh, the ground level insight as to what we do here for the campaigns that we run. So Igor, before we start with the typical brand updates and all of that, I want to get everybody or I want to help everyone get a good understanding of what you do for Web20 Ranker, but also what you do as an SEO. So yeah. I guess I'll start by asking you, how did you get started with SEO? What was the first like role that you really took up for it? I clearly remember there was a story about 10 geese.com. I'm sure you could have heard about that one. Uh, and uh, I learned about this affiliate website that popped off and the owner sold it for a few hundred thousand dollars. So I was like, I guess you can just go online and get do something and get paid a lot. So this is how I got interested in uh, how I got excited about SEO. And that was clearly the beginning. Okay, so did you pretty much start with building your own uh, properties, like your own something to flip, essentially? Uh, yeah, that was the idea. But it, before that, I would have to learn SEO. It's a it's a very vast field, and there's a lot of, a lot to it. So I remember I spent like six to seven months, like full time learning online, like bookmarks full of articles. Learn this, learn that. Try to get those concepts in your head. Um, I think half a year was a little bit too short, too short period. So there was a little bit too much on me back then, but luckily I was able to kind of digest it all and get an idea what really SEO is, how it works. And then eventually, like you said, start building uh, my own uh, ass assets, being affiliate websites that, that I uh, got traffic to through SEO. Okay, very cool. Yeah, that's something that I guess a lot of people that I've met that do SEO, they tend to neglect uh, the personal side of things, which I guess for SEOs, it's like the personal work that you would do. Yeah, typically it falls under like affiliate websites. So I guess for anybody listening, there's a, a very wide variety of different websites that you can build to gain ranking. So that's interesting because it sounds like you did a lot more research than most people before they really dive into things, which probably helped you out with like not overspending or not wasting your time on things that you don't need to. Right. Absolutely. It's so uh, it's such a great time to have all those blogs and people out there who are putting out content. Like I, I imagine 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you wouldn't have that. You would have to like literally go try it. But now you're pretty much, you can just cheat by reading, um, 
as an SEO expert and get an idea of what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. So do you have a favorite type of niche that you work in for those affiliate websites? I don't have too many, to be honest, uh, just like one bigger one and a couple of smaller ones. So the bigger one is a music niche because I, um, I'm into music myself. So that kind of followed my passion there. And um, I often hear this like kind of like, do you want to like go with for the money with into niche for just for money? Or do you want to follow your passion? Well, luckily, I turned out to have uh, a hobby that I uh, did a website about. Yeah, that's pretty much how I've seen it be successful versus not successful. I see a lot of people, they'll get into projects just because they think it's very lucrative, like it just makes a lot of money. And yeah, if that's the only reason why you start a project, I guess it's like, if you think about all the failed projects you've come across, I think a lot of them were just started up by somebody that uh, didn't really have the passion for it. But yeah, I, I think as far as affiliate sites, yeah, I wouldn't recommend that anybody start up a website just because they think they can make money. It's, you know, there's so many opportunities to build a website, to put out content that then creates value of some kind that really you're just kind of hurting yourself, I guess I would say, um, if you work in something that yeah. you don't actually have a passion in. Um, so that's that's pretty cool um, that you actually found something with music. Um, I was... Uh, I was big into playing trombone when I was back in high school, but I never really took my music, my passion for music anywhere outside of that just because I got into SEO and focused on other things. But, um, okay, so you did some affiliate websites. So can you tell us about how you went from, you know, just starting out working on your own projects to all the way up to working with Web20 Ranker, now working on a tremendous amount of different projects? Um, it turns out that building affiliate sites, especially if you're on low budget, it's pretty time consuming and hard. It's a lot of work and also it takes time. So in the meanwhile uh, of, you know, creating content and doing some backlinks and everything, I, I just realized, okay, I guess I could use my knowledge somewhere else at this moment because I need money. I literally don't have any money. So I was like, start. I started looking for jobs and I remember that I got a message on Facebook from from uh, one person who said, hey, you want to try doing this like on page optimization? I'm like, yeah, sure. I know how to do it. And this is how I end up at Web20. Okay, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> so you found, um, I guess you got connected through probably like one of the Facebook groups, I'm guessing. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't even like a group by Web20, it was just one of those SEO groups. Oh, okay. And I was just, you know, invo like, I was like um, edit, uh, typing some posts, you know, like uh, contributing to the group. And um, then I got a message, hey, you want to try it out? Like, yeah. Yeah. That's, Not a problem. So it sounds like a very, um, I guess, because a lot of people that get into these jobs that I know would just kind of like look through job listings. But at least at Web20 Ranker. We don't always just kind of pull employees like that. We do kind of like to find people from within forums or people that have some type of, you know, success or obvious knowledge already that they're showing. Um, so it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to I, I want to think now about. OK, so once you got into Web20, did you immediately get into the role that you're in or no, I guess you said you first started with on page so was it how did it work uh to get you from there to where you are now managing all the different things under managed search that would be a pretty um, uh, long path i would say I, I used to do a bunch of stuff at web 20 that would be on page i think i used to do some some work on the press release department the gmb department and then eventually eventually i got became an assistant of uh, neil we used to manage SEO department. And this is how I eventually got into SEO and uh, Looker Studio reporting because reporting is a part of SEO and then some other stuff with uh, improving the dashboard. It was like a progress, long progress. Okay, yeah, so you've pretty much been able to work across a lot of important areas, which is great. I have yeah. noticed a lot of people in Web20 are very well-rounded, which helps a lot, I've noticed, with just like communicating across the departments. 
So yeah, I, I'm trying to think because I probably came across Web20 like four years ago. I'm trying to think where I would have, uh, where you would have been back then, but I guess you've probably seen me kind of in and out of the Discord group since then. <laughs> um, so, okay. What is your favorite, uh, what's the favorite change that you've made for Web20 Ranker that you think has made like a really big impact? Mm, I think it was a workbook for SEO campaigns where uh, before we would have every month links uh, like copied into a new spreadsheet and um, you would just change anchors, change pages and uh, you, and that's how you would order links. But then uh, you could, you, it was impossible to calculate anchor text because I, will, I remember I would literally open up like a text doc and like do like if this equal that, like what's the percentage? I'm not good in math, so I'm like, okay, I just want to do it once. Uh, and then and not ever have to calculate those uh, again. So I outsourced a regular expression um, pattern to a freelancer who pretty much build this kind of table-like um, format where you have all the links um, in one column, and then it would calculate automatically the, the anchor ratios and give you the pie charts so that uh, that thing saves a ton of time and a ton of and avoided a ton of mistakes, in my opinion. A lot of stuff could have got, could have gone wrong eventually. I mean, like over optimization of the anchor text, if that didn't happen. Yeah, I've definitely seen a lot of uh, similar, if not maybe even some of that same thing being found over on the link recommendation side. So for anybody listening mm -hmm. that hasn't done a link recommendation yet, some of this work that he's mentioning is found within that free uh, I guess you could call it a product that you can acquire from us. So we have a form on our website where you could submit your campaign details, or in this case, your website details more specifically, um, and get some of these readouts, which I know for sure, even if you don't use it to ultimately place the links, it definitely gives you a lot of information as to what the competitors are doing. Um, which I found it to be huge as far as reading the backlink portfolios without actually having to really manually read the whole thing. Uh, so definitely make use of that Absolutely. if you're ordering links and you're just kind of lost because it's going to give you some direction or at least a place to ask better questions, I would say. Uh, so what is, so out of the different changes that you've made, um, what would be now something that you recommend people to do that you don't see them doing on their campaigns right now? On uh, what kind of campaigns? What do you mean? Pretty much out of all the ones that you've seen that come our way to Web20 Ranker, is there anything you would mm -hmm. say that they could be improved with across the board? Um, yeah, uh, definitely. Like the general issue is that sometimes clients are not willing. Well, I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience of managing, doing manage links campaigns. And this is where we're pretty much responsible just for the backlink profile. And this is where I notice a lot of times clients will come in with uh, not so good on page, not so good content, and they will um, have some recommend, re receive recommendations from us. And sometimes, unfortunately, they will not take any action and the campaign will like last a month and month and um, would follow up. But I think that uh, that is the main um, thing I would wish clients to do is uh, kind of participate at least uh, on this service line, because if you're doing managed SEO, you will have that taken care of as part of the service. But like uh, with managed links, it's not just links. It's just a lot of it's a lot of the other stuff that you have to do on site to see the result. Yeah, so that's a pretty big one. If you order that type of help, or if you have somebody that is looking into your campaign and giving you that sort of feedback, uh, especially if you're paying money to buy links to any degree, you've got to be making the on-page adjustments as soon as possible. Um, I guess, yeah, you can only control so much with just the off page mentions. The biggest example I can think of is when somebody has major structural issues, which are just more obvious than other situations. But if they have three pages that are all targeting the same set of service in the same area, which one are we supposed to build links to, right? Because if you tell Igor well, here- Google supposed to know which one, how is Google supposed to know which one to rank, right? 
Yeah, so if you tell like Igor or somebody, you know, managing all the links, it doesn't matter how great they are at it. If you don't follow their instruction as far as what's needed uh, foundational wise, like it, it, it's not going to look pretty. I mean, sure, you, you know, you throw links at it, you see some types of movements, but if you are thinking about the end goal of ranking for the one service query, I guess all of a sudden you can find other things that get in the way. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's a pretty big one there. The fact that just yes. buying links won't save the campaign if you can't get the basics handled on your own. In this case, it's on us to set the right expectations and explain the, 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 the draw the line. Here's what we do. Here's what we can recommend, but we don't do in this case. Yeah, so definitely if somebody's building links for you and they're trying to tell you some improvements to make, there's uh, probably some value to gain from that because they're trying to maximize the links that you're building. So that's a pretty good point. All right, so let me shift gears now. So we recently posted a blog post on our website that actually talks about this exact same topic with anchor text. So across this... This one, so this will be linked in the description where you see this video. But across this page, we have a variety of different pieces of insight regarding the types of anchor text. So I guess that's the first thing when you start to hear about anchor text uh, analysis, competitor analysis, any of that. Um, so first, you want to get a good understanding of the different types. So this is for sure gonna be a great place for you to start to read from us as to how we categorize these. But you will see that other agencies or other you know people that do this type of analysis should be using pretty much the same terminology here. Um, so I think the first step to kind of get a good understanding is to be able to you yourself classify these anchors when you pull them apart in your links. Now, sure, you could you could use Web20 to do this, by the way, because we do have the free link recommendations. But if you're trying to do this all on your own or if you're trying to do it for, let's say, a large number of pages, um, you got to be able to look at the links and be able to classify them yourself for you to then get to the point where you can order a specific type of anchor text. Um, once you even get to that point, I would say, it can get dangerous. So if you haven't already seen the quarter three webinar that we just did, that's another place where we expand on this even more as far as talking about the different ways that it can play out depending on how you implement this. Because there's definitely a right way to use the anchor text analysis in a wrong way. Um, I guess the, the quick answer to, well, what's the wrong way? The wrong way is thinking that you can just simply order, um, let's say, naked URL, naked anchors, or branded anchors for all of your different service pages on the website. So I want to get Igor's thought on this because my thoughts are that the anchor text analysis is huge to get you to understand what all the competitors are doing, but I would say you want to go a step further, not just look at the anchors, but look at what article was used so that you understand the context of that mention. I guess at the end of the day, we're building contextual mentions. So it can be weird to try to order a quality mention if the only instruction that you provide is just the anchor text. Now, that, that's those are my thoughts. Um, and I definitely expanded on this in the web, but I want to ask you, uh, what you think, Igor, about that, about how to really use those instructions once you've analyzed it. I agree with the, what you said about like uh, getting contextual mentions. Uh, well, I guess that in that case, we'll be talking about the vetting the domains, vetting the articles. But uh, talking specifically about the anchor text, uh, I may be a little biased here because uh, during working at Web20, I've never had a site that has been penalized. I've never actually seen a campaign that has had that happen. So uh, I would say that the, the biggest issue from my point of view is waste of budget. If you, if you don't know how to properly set the right anchors, you're pretty much wasting your budget or your client's budget. Uh, because uh, like um, Victor said, 
uh, using naked anchors, uh, just naked anchors or really any other type without any specific strategy will just get will will require will require you more links to get to where you want to be. And using the right anchor ratios will save you the number of links, will save your budget, will make your campaign more efficient and more effective. That's uh, I would say that's the realistic number one issue for a lot of um, businesses. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it because yeah, at the end of the day, you know, if you throw enough links at something, it's going to go up. But when you start to think about the costs involved and then how that carries over to the end client that has to have some type of monthly pricing, it, it just, uh, at least when you manage as many campaigns as we do, the tiniest bit of increase in efficiency from the link, from the link building that can come from that much attention on the anchors that is that is multiplied like so much across like an entire agency so that's kind of why we put that much effort right and especially as your white label partner that's definitely something that you want to see from whoever's managing that link building over the long term uh but yeah i think and yeah i, I guess that that's another way to sum it up or a good way to sum up the because when you say like oh it needs more strategy sometimes people don't understand well what strategy i guess I think if you think about it this way if you are doing anchor text analysis on your competitors and one of their service pages tends to have a bunch of naked URL anchors, according to Ahrefs, right? So don't stop there. Go a little bit further, right? Investigate. Well, wh why do they have all those naked anchor text URLs? Because it might be that they put out uh, a press release or something like that. Yeah. A press release is not the same thing as a guest, you know, a guest post that you maybe paid a lot of money on. So looking a little bit further to see what the connection was that was made, because it does have to make sense at the end of the day. Don't just take the anchor text analysis and, you know, try to stuff the anchor text into a sentence where it doesn't fit. Because as soon as you do anything like that, now you're, you're kind of questioning the quality of that article in its entirety. And once you question the quality of that article in that process, you, you question the entire thing. It's like, because I mean, you're paying so much money. Now everything is into question. So yeah, great. A lot of great points. And if, if you're trying to learn more about that, go back to that quarter three Webby. You can find it on the Web20 Ranker website, but we went pretty in depth and answered a bunch of questions also because we went even further and looked at some bad examples of link building that might be really hard for most people to even tell like to tell the difference. So definitely check that out and send us any of your questions after you've done that, if you still need more to be explained on there. Um, all right, so let, let me see if there's anything else to mention about this blog post because we, we've we had a lot of attention going on for these blog posts. So if you haven't already started to follow uh, the Web20 Ranker blog, definitely head over there and do so. But again, any feedback that you guys have is tremendous for this stuff because it really, you know, helps us deliver better content that you guys really need. Um, I, it looks like everything is just kind of summarizing what we touched upon, the, the over-optimization. So at least having some type of a, a mention on there to warn you to not just kind of, you know, put on the, the, what's it called? Like, don't go into tunnel mode just because you have a little bit of analysis, but uh, anything else you'd want to add to that topic there, Igor, before we get off of this blog post? I would, I would just argue one of the points I try, I'm trying to find it, uh, where you say, it says you have to use exact anchor text once. It's not really that this is wrong. It's just a matter of preferences. I prefer not to ever use exact keyword anchor that okay. like, like exact, exact one. I don't know. I just feel like it's not very rarely you will see this uh, make sense in an article. So I try to like use variations all the time. Like the algo is not stupid. It's it's going to know like you can see you can look at ChatGPT and uh, you can see how it understands your questions. So you can assume that the algo from Google is not dumber and will know if you say like, um, I don't know, uh, we're serving, uh, we're, we're doing plumbing in, in Chicago around Chicago area versus plumber in Chicago that that's the same thing 
Right. Okay. That's a great. Oh, so you're saying that you're you're probably thinking more of the variation, like Chicago area, not thinking ju just the city is what you're saying. It's yeah, variating anchors, adding something into it between it. It's just something that looks always uh, always look natural. Yeah, and it's not. It's not like off of that idea. I could think of so let's say same scenario where I have to build that type of mansion. I, I, I try to think of the same thing where I might think, oh, well, what if we do uh, best plumber Bay Area? You know, B Bay Area, that, that's kind of that's how people reference Chicago. So it's, it's another another mm -hmm. way to do it, right? But um, yeah. it, it, and we, we went into detail with the webinar to try to give a little bit more insight, but I think the gist of it is don't just focus on the one word that you're tracking. Think about the other ways that people search for it because the other ways that people search for it are also the other ways that people reference it. And at the end of the day, you're creating a reference. You can't just grab a random set of words just because it came in from your analysis and throw it in there. It has to actually tell the user why they're getting pointed to that page. So again, you have to explain within the sentence that you use. And so for the anchor that you place, you need to use the sentence. You need to use the paragraph. You even need to use the heading that organizes that paragraph before you use the anchor. Because by the time you get to the anchor that you're placing, you have to be able to explain we're taking you, the reader, here. And this is why. This is the info that you will find once you get there. That's what you're trying to explain with the anchor text. So you can kind of see how if you're not thinking about these connections, you could just be doing a bunch of gibberish that Google might not be counting at all, uh, which comes back to what Igor said, which is like at the end of the day, you want to you want to rank with less rank, less links because that's less money and less time. So I guess that's yeah, that's pretty much a, a, a good way to put it there. But. Um, I'll go back and read through it, but that's a good point also, like what you said. Um, it's never absolute. It's never you need this exactly and in this specific way. It's, oh, okay, we need a really good something close to exact match. Let's not do exact match, though. Let's try to get a little bit more creative. Um, that, that's basically the gist of it, but okay. Wow. So... Let's shift over now and hit, uh, let's look at the SEO news. Actually, sorry, before I hit mm -hmm. the news, let me get something really important out of the way. So brand updates. So I just talked about the Webby that we did, um, but other than the Webby, we also uh, just finished up the 4th of July sale. Finished up as in, we have finally picked out the winners. Now I have their account info here, but I don't wanna just name off the email, so. <laughs> The winners are going to be announced today and it's going to be done over email or sorry, this is pre-recorded. So by the time that you're watching this, the email should have already gone out. So check your emails if you participated in the sale. I believe we'll also announce them in the group, but I just have emails in front of me right now. So I don't want to just disclose those to everybody. But we have a we have three tiers of winners, two of them that get regular prizes. Uh, there's one top, um, the top purchaser of the entire sale does win that exclusive mastermind. So if you haven't heard of it already, we are currently planning out a mastermind. It's gonna be a way more exclusive one than before. It's gonna be mainly myself, Mark, Nate, and Mike are gonna be there as far as putting together a more tight knit uh, workshop type of environment to be able to really provide value to all the people that uh, get to participate there. But it's not going to be like the typical one that you might have gone to uh, at other places. So it's not going to be like a big one that's open to everybody. Um, be on the lookout again if you participated in the sale because that would mean that you may have uh, won a ticket to go to that event. So we don't know the specific city yet, but it's in Pennsylvania. So uh, in September, probably first or second week. So be on the lookout for marketing material uh, to see what else is going on with that mastermind. Now, is that it for brand updates? Yeah, that's, that's it for brand updates. But again, we spent a lot of time on that Webby. So for sure, check that out and let me know what your feedback is. 
Now it's time to head over to the SEO news, as we typically do. So we've picked out a bunch of different topics that we think are important for you. I think even before I start diving into some of these, I want to give a quick recap of kind of where we are online. So a lot of the things or, or something that I've noticed is if we're so focused on work, sometimes we kind of miss what's going on. So looking at the news is great, but also trying to look at not just SEO news. Um, so something that I think is going to start to become more relevant here is just in the past few weeks, we've seen, uh, so Igor, have you noticed the uh, with Twitter and Reddit lately, what's been going on? Cause I feel like there's not a lot of people in the SEO industry talking about it, but I do think it's going to start to make pretty large changes uh, to the platform soon. Do you know what I'm talking about? Well, I'm not exactly sure. Is that the restriction about the kind of their APIs and how much you can scrape. Yeah, so that's something that I think a lot of us have kind of taken for granted is our ability to really scrape or just use APIs for free from these companies. So if you weren't aware, Twitter, there's a whole scenario going on right now uh, with Elon Musk making a bunch of changes, but I wanted to bring up Twitter as far as well as Reddit because even Reddit now starting to charge for API usage um, and Twitter now implementing a bunch of changes to prevent people from scraping the data off of their platform. They've even gone in, it looks like they're uh, starting up a lawsuit against Meta, accusing them of scraping their data to form threads, <laughs> which is another platform that just kind of came up in the last few weeks. So um, I know I haven't been on threads yet. Have you been on threads yet, Igor? Not yet. So the only reason, yeah, I'm going to go on it just because it's gaining traction and I just kind of want to see what's going on in there. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of things changing nowadays. Uh, one thing that I can point to is with Reddit, you know, a lot of, a lot of searches, a lot of informational searches on Google are obviously done with Reddit added in there as a variation to the keyword. Uh, but as uh, we see some subreddits kind of closing down from their inability to moderate their subreddits. Uh, I, I guess it might be interesting to see uh, maybe potentially less information being so openly available, uh, which I, I mean, at the very least that could, that could cause some shakeups in the SERPs, but I think we'll have to kind of see what, how it's playing out with the whole protests and everything on that side. Yeah. The story is not over. Yeah, so I'm definitely I'm watching I'm watching on to that, even though the SEO people haven't really caught on to it too much yet. Uh, okay, so getting into these different news items. So something from John Mueller: No ranking factor compensates for missing relevance. Uh, so this was something posted on the SEO roundtable. Uh, it, it was just a mention from John Mueller saying it's easy to forget that a site doesn't just rank on its own it ranks for what it's relevant for. Semantic HTML helps Google understand your content, but it is not a ranking factor and doesn't help you rank better. Um, so let me pull up, let me pull up the actual comment here to see what the original question might have been. Oh, this is actually on Mastodon. That's interesting. So if you, if you guys don't know Mastodon, a lot of people are jumping over there in protest of Twitter, in protest of Reddit, whatever, but, um, let me take a look here. Okay, so the original question, somebody asked them, does semantic HTML help search identify and evaluate content was the question that was sent to him. So yeah, so I think what he's plainly trying to explain is the relevance isn't like a ranking factor per se. It's like there's two, there's two things. One, one, it's almost like, I guess I would call it the eligibility to rank. So before you're eligible to rank for something, you have to be known for providing that service. Let's say if it's a service term um, or a product, yeah. you, you have to be known for that product. You can't be a roofer that can somehow rank for uh, cookies or books or something like that um until you do some type of a work to gain relevance whether it's publishing pages on your website that talk about that product or service or a lot of times with local seo publishing that information on third-party websites citations profiles all of that stuff 
wondering if you have anything to add to that, Igor. I, I the the thing that you just said, I like to refer to it as direction, like refer relevancy direction, because if you don't like, you can get all the leaks in the world, you can do the be the best tech on page uh, implementation, but if you're not, if you if you don't have relevancy, if you don't have enough um, articles covering the topics that how are you, how are you expecting to rank? And I would just add that um, I I really agree with what uh, John Miller said because. I'm a big fan of uh, ranking clusters as opposed to ranking individual articles. Uh, clusters is like a group of uh, articles relate around a related topic. So if you have that and you interlink that and you start shooting links to all of those pages, that is gonna push all the cluster up, not just a single individual page. So that just, I guess, proves that relevancy is core yeah, and I think that's a great point to make as far as um, even just for typical local campaigns. <laughs> because I see there's a lot of people that the way they track their keywords, it might just be a few individual ones that they've set up on a tracker. Uh, but a lot mm -hmm. of times you might get better information if you do something like look at all of the movements from Search Console or Ahrefs or something like that. Because at least... Yeah, when I talk to my clients, I try to not focus on one keyword and one variation. I try to focus on that service, the whole service, because it's like, okay, we're trying to push that service in this city. Well, maybe the one variation that you mentioned didn't go up, but I have over a dozen other variations that did. And at the end of the day, what, like, what matters? The one rank or the aggregation of all of those relevant keywords because you know I, if i can bring up keywords for everything that relates i rather do that and focus on the combined vis visibility than trying to set up like an organic tracker that only looks at a few here and there um, so that's a great point to just um you know kind of give people insight as to the way they even look at ranks because i definitely see people that are a little bit too like tunnel visioned yeah, and a lot of times we might not even know about the typical standard keywords that we expect to be the most valuable are actually not because some uh, some long tail variations will have a stronger intent and people will tend to convert more off that little keyword than your main keyword that, uh, that is that you're trying to rank. That's a great point. Yeah, even thinking about the levels of intent and at the end of the day, it's like, are we just going to shoot for one? Or should we just try to grab all of them? Because that's, I mean, if you're thinking about the leads, not just the traffic, the leads, it's like, that is what you kind of have to look at. So lots of great information there. But okay, the next one, I think this is a really good one. So I definitely get questions about this from people that are newer to WordPress also. But Another one from John Mueller or one where he commented, but the question is essentially, um, does it matter if when you do your blog posts, you put them in a blog folder or if you just do sl like domain.com slash and then it's the title. So again, to reiterate, um, if you post on your blog, you could have the permalink, permalink set up to where all of the URLs for those blog posts have slash blog as the path in front of it. And really what they're asking John here is, does it matter if you do that or not even put it in a blog folder at all? Um, so broad level, John Mueller saying, no, it doesn't matter. Um, but I would say that it matters as far as organizing things, as far as your internal process. And I'll explain things like this. So let's say you crawl an entire website. Let's say the website is 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 pages. If all the blog posts follow the slash blog path, if all of your pages for this one city follow that city path, if all of them under one category follow the path of the category, that website's going to be almost instant for you to be able to analyze as far as what all pages are accounted for versus one where you put everything in the root folder. So I will say that because when you think about that, there's a big difference. And I can even think about going on Ahrefs or SEMrush and I wanna look at, let's say, uh, let me look at all the ranks from all the service pages under this city. 
I can do that using the path setting where I just put in the path everything right before that spot in the URL. You might not be able to do that with other structures. So, you know, just some, some stuff to think about there. I don't know, Igor, if you if you have a preferred way or what you think about that. No, I absolutely agree with you. I would just add that if you're doing this um, method with uh, structuring everything, you're also making it easier for competition to analyze your site, but also <laughs> make it, it e easier for yourself and other and vice versa. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so, okay, uh, let's see this next one. I don't know if that's that important. Let me skip down to Bing Desert. Looks like there's an update here on the Bing search results. So it looks like Bing is testing uh, branded side labels. Let me take a good look. Okay, there we go. So just to visualize for anybody listening in, uh, right next to to the left of the listings that come up on the organic SERPs. It looks like they're starting to test now putting um, essentially like the site icon and then the name of the brand to the left of it. Uh, I don't know if I like it. I, 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 th I think it's a little bit too big. I think they probably should just keep it to how Google does it where it's just a little site icon uh, as a circular thing and that's it. But it's interesting to see that they can definitely uh, or they're definitely aggregating information and kind of like accumulating it under the brand, which I mean, that's kind of just the same stuff that we've been looking at on Google's side, as far as Google seeing uh, more or starting to look more as the brand as a whole versus just, you know, maybe what links are pointed to this page or this page. Uh, nothing too crazy there though, just some, you know, ongoing updates on the Bing platform. So, is there anything else out of here that you think is important, Igor? Some of these is, you know, we, we have um, tiny little updates to platforms here and there, but, you know. Um, the only thing that I caught that caught my eye is that Google Business Profile is dropping goal tracking. Oh, it's yes. It's interesting. It's been around for ages. Now they're dropping it. That is know. a great one. I was, I was reading this actually very early this morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Looks like Barry posted the. Oh, this was yesterday, but I was reading this very early this morning. Um, so it was Ben Fisher over on Twitter that went and posted this first. It looks like um, they're talking about. So okay, so what we're talking about is not when you put your own tracker on the GBP, but when you enable the call tracking feature that Google handles on their own. So I know I've had a client before freak out when they noticed that it was like a different number that was getting rung, which I don't know, that was a little bit weird, but it basically routes the number through like a Google number to get better tracking, I guess, or, or to, enab to enable the voice tracking, to the extra tracking features. Um, so this does not include just the regular people that click and the tracking that you get as far as how many people clicked on the call button. This is talking about the additional tracking features that were on it. So now people were reporting on various bugs going on. So this might have happened to one of your clients, but um, the bug was that it would essentially route them to a wrong business, like a competitor. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's the reason or whether there were other issues going on that they couldn't fix, they decided, you know what, we're going to pull it back. Um, which is interesting to see, right? When they, when they kind of roll back something that they added, but looks like that's uh, on its way out for anybody that might've been using that. I, I haven't been using, I, I use my own tracker numbers if I need a track. I don't know, I don't know anybody that was actually relying on that, but that's going away. Yeah. So, and th there was some, there was some confirmed Google News indexing issues. Uh, I don't have uh, any websites that I own myself that are Google News, um, but if I did, I'd probably be trying to monitor their indexation just because it looks like there's some changes going on with that, uh, the Google News, I guess, verification. So um, it would mm -hmm. be a good, good time to check your websites and see how they're indexing, at least the new content that you're publishing on there. Um, anything else, Igor, that you want to add to the news? That you might have heard of? Uh, no, not really. Not really. Not not, any, not not anything worthy. I'd say. 
Right, like right. Morning. I did see some people were talking about another algorithm update that was causing some volatility. So if you check uh, the volatility trackers, the various companies that do that, you will see a bit of an uptick over the past week. Um, I believe, no, actually, I was not able to hear of any particular niche that was affected by it. But we definitely know it wasn't a broad level thing where everybody or a lot of niches were having issues because we would have heard about it by now. But at least yeah. at least with the local businesses, I'm not seeing any difference. Are you seeing any negative impacts, Igor? Something random or unexpected? Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Not recently. Thankfully, that is the case. Uh, I wonder if anybody's in any sort of weird niche that might have had movements happen. But uh, definitely let us know if so. But no nothing crazy for us to worry about on our end. So, all right, before we wrap up for today, we've got some questions from the local client takeover group. Actually, just one question for us today. So this one is from, I believe it is Enk Ose. So he posted on local client takeover group. Let's take a look here. Hey guys, I have a keyword, pros plus target keyword plus city. Okay, so like maybe like pro plumber, Houston or something that was used as an anchor. It represents 70% of my backlinks anchors or about 300 backlinks. Interesting. <laughs> uh, my competitor's anchor text ratio is 80% branded or naked. I'm sitting in positions 10 to 20 for money keywords. I would like to boost the rankings of this old site. Does using exact match anchors even more will effectively, will affect negatively the rankings? And what would you do in my position? Okay, so I think the good thing that happened so far is he identified that his anchors don't look like his competitors. So there is a level of now inspection that you would want to do to then figure out why. Um, so I do want to kind of ask or, you know, if that person would reply. But what I would do in that post, um, I'll check or I'll try to get an answer from the person. Because the first thing I would ask is, okay, what are they... Wait, what types of articles do they have naked and branded anchor text from? Because if they're all press releases, that's going to be one easy way for you to go and acquire those. Um, Igor, what do you think about this situation so far? I know it's not a lot of context. Yeah, yeah, not a lot of context, but I guess answering the question, no, I would definitely not continue building um, that type of target anchors for sure because it's already more than enough 70 percent but then uh, i guess uh, it's 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 a lot about it's about many other factors i would um you, you can really give good advice based on the information we have because uh, we don't know anything else about the site about the competition and everything i guess i'm just wondering why do you have um 70 percent of your anchors target i guess um yeah that's be another the agency that's like the better question, right? Is how did you arrive to have that many anchors from that many links? So further than that, I'd be like, okay, that's a count for backlinks. What is the count if you count it by domains? And then what's the count if you narrow in on the do follow ones even more so? Um, I'm wondering, do you have that type of, would you suggest that type of uh, idea also to look for do follow uh, more? Because so, this is what I've been doing. I've been looking at the particular ones that are do follow. I will look at the no follow ones also, but at least in the context of guest blog post submission, submitting an article for a contextual link like that, I don't look at the no follow ones. I'm wondering what you think about that. Oh, well, that's a good point. I personally haven't been paying attention to that to the that much, but it's a good point that I may consider. And I agree with you generally, like speaking of the, like what kind of advice would, would I give to this person? I would first um, stop building target anchors. And secondly, I would start uh, analyzing the gap between you and the competition based on many other metrics. Topics, uh, not number just of preferring anchor. domains to the page, to the site, what's your content, how many uh, indexed uh, articles you have, etc., and so on, right? So it's not just that, just uh, fixing the anchors will not get you ranking from page two to page one immediately. Right, right. So I think the best way to really help that guy is to actually see or get the URL of his website and check it out for ourselves. But um, yeah, you know, probably not the best to continue to build links like that, um, especially if you have so many of them. But 
The last thing I'll say is the competitor analysis, if you are in a position where the competition is not that high, I guess it's like the lower the competition is, the less that you can take away from the analysis, at least what I would say. Um, just because there's like a lot more uh, random things done in low competition settings that may not be what takes you to achieve that rank. There's a lot more, I guess we could say, like think about all the random mistakes or odd things that marketers do when they don't know how to compete in something tough. You have to decipher or you have to filter that out from when you're looking at. So that's why just getting, you know, just understand or just hearing it from somebody else that they have this many anchors is not always enough to go with. Um, but yeah, that, that's a that very good point. That's a very good point. I, I guess I could have also added that there's a certain fresh line or baseline where if you're below that, you don't want to be doing what your competition does because they may not may not be the best SEO practice. Yeah, and that's, that's probably the hardest for somebody new to manage because you might have to reference just all the good practices and you build what a top ranking uh, business really should look like in that area. So that's, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, okay, that is going to be it for our questions. And that's going to bring us to the end of our show here. So before I wrap us up, though, do you have anything you want to add, Igor? Is there anything that you think people should be looking at that they're not already looking at outside of the anchors, I guess, that we talked about there? Um, I think we covered a lot. Honestly, if somebody's watching uh, this uh, vault making notes, they should have uh, a lot of notes already. Um, when, when it comes to do, uh, doing competitor analysis or building up the topical clusters like John Mueller says, or uh, looking laser focused uh, uh, anchor uh, text analysis. So they should have plenty of notes at this point. Okay. Well, if anybody wants to follow your stuff, um, I know some of our, some of our staff at Web20 are starting to contribute to blog posts. So check the website. I'm not sure if you've contributed yet, Igor, have you? I could have by a different name or I don't know. I think I did a couple of articles, but they could not be under my name. Okay. Well, otherwise, how can people find you and your work online? Um, hit up Web20 Ranker. I don't really have any online uh, kind of like... Um, website or anything just a personal facebook profile so i okay. guess i could share that if uh if people want to reach out to me so hit up yeah hit up the web 20 ranker chat and say i want to speak with igor <laughs> but uh all, all right. right well thank you so much for joining me today so again this was episode 198 and thank you so much for everybody that joined. Thank you for those that leave us comments. If you haven't yet, make sure to drop a like on the video and share this podcast with any of your friends that are in the SEO industry. We publish a video every week on Wednesdays. So be sure to check us out on your favorite podcast platform, whichever one that might be. If not, seovault.com is the other place to find the videos. Thank you so much. Oh, and if you're not in the local client takeover group just yet, search for it on Facebook and join that right now because that is where we're posting all of our updates and all of our other fun conversations. So thank you again for watching, guys, and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.